three, Welcome back, everybody. We are in the in the bottom half of our uh, twenty four hour uh, marathon here, the Global Town Hall and Sports. You know, uh, speckles throughout the entire meeting so far has been discussions of neglected foot and ankle uh, pathologies, and so we've got a session, a really nice one, focused specifically on neglected foot and ankle pathologies mm -hmm. as it relates to sports. And Dr. Rajiv Shah will moderate this and take us through it with uh, esteemed faculty well, from. We are. If you could tell yours. Thanks. Bottom half um, I do also want to thank Curve Beam, by the uh, way, for the sponsorship of this. Sports. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, speckles throughout. The thank you, Celine, so and thank you, Parik Family Foundation, for giving us ankle, this great uh, opportunity. Thumb. And before I start, I would wish to introduce my panel. My panel comprises of uh, great people from the Eastern world. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Kwai Ming, who is the present president of Hong Kong Foot and Ankle Society and a great foot and ankle faculty. We have Professor Chua from Malaysia, who is a renowned foot and ankle surgeon and vice chairman of Asia Pacific Foot and Ankle Council and Professor Carlo Borbon from Philippines, who is the present president of Philippine Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. So without wasting much time, I will go on to presenting some neglected foot and ankle sports cases. And I would want esteemed panelists to give their esteemed opinion onto various questions which would be generated going forward into this presentation. So, Typically, neglected injuries are defined as all those which are either poorly managed, late presented, or absolutely untreated. So I'm starting with case number one. Now, if you listen to the case story, he is a young professional kabaddi player. Kabaddi is a game which is very commonly played in this part of the world. And India was one of the uh, key country to start it. And this young professional kabaddi player while playing dislocated his first metatarsophalangeal joint. And this was one year back. So dislocation on the spot was reduced by himself. And thereafter he had multiple such dislocations while playing and every dislocation was self-reduced. So when he presented to us, these were the x-rays. And Professor Chua, may I start with you? Uh, what do you infer from this x-ray? These are AP and oblique x-ray, and here is the lateral x-ray. So your view point onto this x-rays. Uh, thanks, Rajesh. So this... Uh... Uh, AP view and the oblique view of the forefoot. And maybe I can uh, describe that there is some evolution fractures uh, because the sesamoid is displaced, especially the lateral sesamoid. And there is some like loose body or the previous injury of the uh, inside the joint. So meaning that there is maybe the uh, media correctory ligament over the uh, first MTP joint, oh, sorry, yes. the lateral correctory ligament uh, of the first MTP joint that maybe is a evolution. Hence, the uh, ligament is laxity, so he will get frequent uh, subluxation or dislocation that can be cell re reduced. Yeah. So yeah. yes, you are absolutely right. Here, this patient used to have recurrent medial or habitual medial dislocation of first metatarsophalangeal joint. And this were the x-rays on presentation. And we also got a sesamoid view. Uh, uh, anything else you want to say on to this, Professor Chua? Yeah, the lateral sesamoid seemed to be subluxated from the groove of the uh, MTP joint. So... Uh, a habitual medial dislocation of first metatarsophalangeal joint 
and then instead of ct there was availability of the mri professor carlo if you could uh, comment on to this mri pictures this was a t2 weighted image this was a t1 weighted image and uh, your view point on to this okay um so basically in the t1 weighted images um you can see that there was um sorry there um you can see that there's already a avulsion of the um medial collateral uh, lateral collateral ligament of the first mtp joint and if you go to the t1 there's also uh, uh probably um, a vul um a rupture of that of dr aluchi's longest tendon attachment and uh, i think this Great. is the main reason why um it displaces immediately so with this sort of uh, presentation uh what would you be uh, doing professor kwai ming yeah um i think there's a rupture of the tibial phalangeal sesamoid ligament and some of the uh, lateral uh, 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 the fibular phalangeal sesamoid ligament and the lateral collateral ligament in fact um, for this type uh, of injury we should um try to repair the ligament to restore the a uh, connection between the sesamoid and the possible phalanx now do you think that at the end of one year with multiple such dislocations you would really be having the enough tissues to repair the ligament uh it may not have uh, enough tissue sometimes okay yeah we may use a uh, um if the motion is still try to reserve preserve the motion we may um use other maybe a tendon graft to try to repair uh it to the uh, farming to the same way to the farming if possible yeah. okay professor chua what would be your treatment approach for this patient obviously he needs surgery and he doesn't want arthrodesis of first mtp joint because he has a long professional career in front mm. of him yeah this is a difficult case huh? uh, so maybe if it's not possible to repair uh, i was thinking that if we can remove the lateral fibula sesamoid and then from there you should get enough of the soft tissue to to repair uh, to tighten the joint by sacrificing the sesamoid uh, i'm not sure it is a correct treatment for this professional uh, player uh, okay professor carlo or do you think that at the end of one year where he had uncountable habitual medial dislocation you would get enough tissues when you go in for the reconstruction i agree we will need to exercise the lateral sesamoid no question about it but for repair of lateral collateral ligament of mtp joint would you get the enough tissues um i think the problem with the multiple this uh, with all these locations is that the, you might have a uh, tissue there but it's not good enough to be to support as a lateral collateral ligament so i would agree with them excising that lateral sesamoid and probably shifting that soft tissue there um I'm not sure though with the type of sport. Um, I'm not familiar with kabaddi, professor, but uh, I don't know if you do a lot of weight bearing on the first MTP because that may play a factor if you really need to excise that sesamoid, or probably just like the previous speaker earlier, where in instead of dealing with the sesamoid, they just change the shoe wear and maybe at least that will prolong the career of your patient. So uh, I thought that. i am not going to have the adequate tissues to repair and so i was all committed to do reconstruction so i went in with the preparation of reconstructing this with the tendon graft uh, uh, typically i like to position this patients into a position with the head low position and i am standing and foot is in front of me facing like this and any specific insist and preference you have professor uh, kwai 
for this or um, you approach with double incision single incision i think a uh, double incision um may be used in fact uh, one incision is that uh, on the middle side of the uh, foot um from uh, another is a uh, for the um, panthers um side of the sole at the first space to have a direct visualization exploration of the the uh, sesamoid, the fibular sesamoid, and is a ligament. Okay. So, Professor Chua, what incision would you take for approaching this case? Yeah, um, I will use the median lateral incision. The lateral incision, I will follow the ball of the, you know, like, like the, the, the first MTP joint. We follow the curve of the uh, big toe uh, all over the planta aspect so that uh, you can uh, really go into that and need to be careful of the nerve that is just surrounding over the sesamoid. Uh, and then the other one, we will use the media incision. But I saw you use just a single curve incision. Yeah. yeah. So for the uh, want of the time, I would move forward with what I did. I used the single... Uh, uh, incision, uh, which was a J shaped incision, and I raised the uh, flap like this. And when I went in further, I excised the lateral sismoid, and then I found there was no soft tissues at all to really do the reconstruction. So if you have to do some ligament reconstruction into metatarsals, metatarsophalangeal joint, uh, Professor Carlo, which tendons would you use for the reconstruction? Are you going to um, use hamstring or, or, or what, what tendons would you like to use for reconstructing the ligament? Um, usually for foot for, um, reconstructions, I prefer to use the palmaris longus. I think that will be a very um, easily um, uh, extractable tendon and um, uh, you don't need a really long one here. Usually for other reconstructions, you might need the hamstring if, if the palmaris is not available. I think it's too big already. So a palmaris would be yeah. enough here. So uh, does anyone... Uh, from the faculty use uh, plantaris or the extensor of the fourth toe? Professor Chua, Professor Ming? Yeah, I think uh, plantar is a wonder choice, but uh, sometimes it may be absent in some people. Exactly. For instance, we use uh, maybe use half uh, of the extended tendon as a uh, tendon part. Yeah. And Professor Chua? Yeah, I'm agree with the uh, 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 Professor Siu that uh, sometimes plantaris can be used, but sometimes it's absent. So that essentially was the scenario. And so I went in with a palmaris longus graft. Uh, and then it was, uh, you know, prepared. Tension was given and I reconstructed it, passing it into the base of proximal phalanx and into the neck of the uh, great toe. And uh, now, once I did this reconstruction, uh, toe was quite stable. Otherwise, it used to get dislocated just by a pressure of the finger. And this was the scar, healing of the scar. This was the postoperative clinical and radiological picture. This was a scar. He, in fact, went back to the sports and this were the uh, uh, movements, almost uh, a normal range of movement in Kabaddi. You need to, you know, be on your tip of the toes. And it's a game which uh, is a contact spot and you require uh, 
uh, i mean the player goes into the other uh, other player's uh, area and his foot is pulled and he is thrown on the ground this is how that this game works so with the full movements he uh, was back and he is presently playing a uh, professional kabaddi league uh so reconstruction of lateral ligament of first metatarsal phalangeal joint was done with palmaris longus any comments uh, on to this procedure by uh, professor chua professor carlo professor uh, ming uh, what different thing would you have done and have you ever encounter such a kind of neglected case um later call quickly go ahead successful success about the reconstruction of the ligament yeah having um i will do the similar thing yeah if it cannot repair the it then uh, use a tendon graft okay uh, yeah. my question uh, rajiv is um, what did he use to fix the tendon in this case did he use a, a tenodesis screw or a suture anchor yeah so that's <laughs> that's a great question so when i did this we did not had availability of the tenodes screw uh, of the smaller size now is available in india so i had to pull the tendon out through the tunnel and i had to use a, a, a bone uh, tunnel sutures pull out sutures to suture it onto the both sides uh, and then this was also published in the journal of the foot as it rare case of recurrent uh, uh, medial dislocation of first metatarsophalangeal joint in a professional athlete uh, let me go to case number 2 this was a 10 years old girl who is a state level badminton champion and coming from the uh, you know town uh, background she used to practice into a court sort of a ground which was made to serve as a court and she had a monkey bite while playing and you say this is quite common because if you don't have a professional uh, court you are playing on the grounds where this sort of problem can occur and then while she was playing there was a seg- there was a monkey bite which resulted into segmental tear of tendon achilles with this two clws and this is how it looked like uh, so uh, uh, this tear in an emergency was repaired by a local general surgeon uh, a segmental tendon achilles tear in a 10 years old girl uh, professor chua would you like to repair it at the first juncture or would you just do a debridement and keep it open in view of a uh, bite by an animal yeah this is a very <laughs> difficult case with the state prayer um there be a different approach so uh, i think uh, first the debridement is very very important and need to see how how dirty is a tendon whether we still can repair back or not and whether you need to keep the wound open and do the vacuum dressing and then only go back in when the wound clean to do the repair but if to put back the primary tendon which is uh, dirty i'm not sure it's a good idea or not uh, however he's a she's a badminton state player and very young uh, being a young he may have a chance compared to the adult uh, we may need to give the chance to see whether uh, the tendon repair put back the primary tendon and still survive and no infection there is a more important thing at this junction yeah because this is a quite is a kind of injury uh, which will have a lot of contamination and you really do not know the extent of the Uh, soft tissue injury at the day one so normally uh, people advocate that you just put in a tag sutures onto the tendon ends and do the debridement keep it open unfortunately this was primarily sutured sutured in tension 
and this patient because he was treated by a general surgeon was also not mobilized immobilized so no splintage or a plaster slab was given so he was just given a simple bandage and so movements were also continued and obviously the infection set in general surgeon went on doing debridement and he did debridement twice the wound had a pus drainage and they were not healing the scabs once you remove the scab it used to start pouring the pus and this is the time she was sent to us so it was like 3 to 4 weeks i guess more than that post trauma uh, this were the uh, uh, pictures like i i think i have an x ray also so professor carlo if this patient comes to you with this delayed presentation of segmental tendoachillis tear with an infection draining wound uh, how would you approach this 10 years old girl all right um number one i think um you have to do adequate debridement based on the looks of this um wounds i i don't think they did the proper debridement like we orthopedic surgeons do which is basically to excise to excise all that scab tissue um properly open the achilles tendon in order to make sure that you have adequate um drainage of whatever debris is left in there no um you can see that i think they were just trying to clean it and clean it but not necessarily do the proper debris map because so you have to understand especially if you have a segmental um, rupture of the achilles tendon there's a likelihood that that segmental um defect um is already infected too so they probably should have cleaned that as well now um also next would be um do a proper culture for this um because um, you have to remember the teeth of any animal or even humans uh, is the dirtiest portion so we have to make to get the proper bacteria in order to do the adequate um, treatment of the infection points very well taken the debridement was not done by the orthopedic surgeon and obviously when you have a segmental cut of the tendon achilles by an animal bite the segment of the tendon achilles has to go and with the drainage debridement was due so it was at the end of 4 weeks that we went in when this patient was sent to us we did the debridement and we ended up in loss of tendon achilles which was to the tune of 12 cm so professor kwai uh 10 cm long defect of tendon achilles in a 10 years old sports man how would you approach next with his wounds healing nicely everything healing like this and the question was how to bridge 12 cm defect in a sports person who is aged 10 years with a good future forward I think it's a very difficult problem because there's also a, a very long segment of the uh, tendon Achilles, and um, I think if the, um, there's no further infection and also the wound uh, become clean and uh, no bacterial growth, I think uh, we may use a um, tendon transfer. to reconstruct the uh, new tendon for this uh, girl yeah i think there may be um, some options i think uh, maybe uh use the um, fhl it may be a bit small but i uh, is one of the uh, option i think yeah. so professor chua would you use fhl in a 10 years old girl or you would use something else uh for this big gap uh because she is a badminton player um i think i will not use the uh, fhl because this will affect the jumping uh for them to to have this jumping and uh, smash in the in the uh, badminton um likely you can use the tendon graft 
that uh, we have this uh, artificial tendon graph that from the company. Uh, this is the only thing I can think of for her. Uh, to take the FHL for this type of sport, uh, people uh, may have a little bit of problem. If it's no jumping type of uh, sport, that is quite okay. But I think for badminton, they may have some problem uh, from my experience. Uh, uh, but you see, either allograft or synthetic graft uh, are not available. Nor this patient, uh, if at all, is available, can get it imported. So you left out with uh, some kind of transfer from the body itself. Well, so in non-availability yeah. of synthetic grafts, what would be the option? I mean, one of the options is the uh, use of the fossil lata, but uh, it may, the fossil lata may not be um, so long, but when we measure about it, and um, I don't know what is maybe one option, yeah. Professor Carlo, what would be your approach? Which tendon would you use okay, um, for reconstruction? Yeah, I would agree with Yokpin. I will not use the FHL for this case. Uh, I think it's because of her sport, which is badminton. Um, I would probably be using a hamstring grab for this in order to have an adequate length and probably a good girth. The good thing with the hamstrings is that they grow well afterwards. So I think there will be a better option for, for her sport specifically. Okay, let me show you what I did. So wounds have already healed. And so we went in and we did the surgery number five. A prone position I draped both the lower limbs and I harvested flexor hallucis longus and passed it through the tendon Achilles, making a loop, making a sort of a, a loop over it and then uh, push that into the heel with a, a biotinodesis screw, matching the tension of the opposite side. These are the intraoperative pictures. This is how it looked at the end, and this was after everything healed. Typically, we feel that whether this per, this girl who has to jump while playing badminton would she be ever would it be ever possible for her to return back to the sports? And look at this. She is running, and she is able to raise herself onto single heel raise without any problem. And this is her uh, dancing in a marriage ceremony. And uh, she is, you know, dancing with that affected limb up. And in a plantar flex position, she is taking the load onto that affected or operated uh, FHL tendon. This is how she is able to jump with the slim and this is where she got first prize in a dancing competition uh, you know six or nine months post FHL reconstruction for lost tendo Achilles so uh, any uh, uh, comments on to this uh, any uh, anybody uh, Professor Chua uh, was it an experiment which I did? I. Uh, what is your viewpoint? Can she go back to the back. state level of the badminton? Yeah, I was informed that she has already been selected into the state team, and uh, I'm yet waiting for her, uh, you know, performance on the ground. But she has been doing this training. She has already started playing, and. Maybe I feel I feel that in a younger age group, uh, because there were huge potential to recover, FHL may work. I also had my all reservations whether she'll be able to uh, lift herself on her toes. But you see, she is already uh, 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 doing that. 
very easily. I think that's the advantage of being young, Professor. <laughs> you have a lot of potential. Yeah. 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 So, uh, if you have any other comment, anybody, or I move to my next case. Professor Ming, Kwai, Professor Kwai, you have something to say? Uh, I'll do post. Please proceed to the case. Please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So here is the next uh, neglected uh, sports case. Now, in 2016, this middle-aged patient, he developed dislocation of fourth metatarsophalangeal joint while playing recreational football, that too without footwear. So these are weekend warriors who uh, go to play. And then while playing, he listened to a click and there was a dislocation of fourth MTP joint and he just sat down and he noticed that his toe had gone into uh, some different positioning and then some other players they came in look don't worry we'll just do it and then they pulled the toe and they reduced the dislocation and no treatment was taken after that episode. Thereafter this gentleman had multiple such episodes of dislocations whenever he used to wear a closed footwear. So if he used to wear a shoe, immediately he'll listen to a click and he will be forced to remove the shoe and then he will notice that his toe has gone dislocated. He'll pull it and self-reduce it had never been able to use closed footwear for last three years. And in from last three months, he also started having neuritic pain between fourth and fifth toe, which probably mandated him to reach out to us for that intense neuritic pain. And he also thought that I must be able to wear the shoe. So with this history on, this were the clinical pictures. Any any guesswork, uh, Professor Chua, going in your mind? About this it, injury? Clinically, it looks like uh, it's a PIP joint. Not at the MTP it's joint. MTP joint. Uh, Metatarsophilia. Yeah, MTP joint. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because the deformity looks like it's at the PIP. Uh, yeah, it looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a different picture, you know. I just a representative picture. It's a female patient. We're talking about the male patient. So it's oh, at the MTP okay. joint. Okay. So when he came to us, he had tender plantar aspect of the fourth metatarsophalangeal joint. So could be easily dislocated dorsally with just side-to-side -side compression of foot between both pamps and toe could be reduced with longitudinal traction and manipulation and toe used to remain stable after reduction. So look at this video. I am pressing with, yeah, and so it dislocated and it relocated. So I'll again run this video. Yeah, this is how it would be relocated. So it used to go in for a dorsal dislocation when, when pressed. So that's how it gets dislocated dorsally and you give a traction and you pull it and maneuver it, it would easily get relocated. So it was a neglected habitual dorsal dislocation of fourth metatarsophalangeal joint on use of closed footwear. So what next? Professor Chua, it's a dorsal dislocation of fourth metatarsophalangeal joint. This guy has now neuritic pain, plus he wants to use the footwear. 
So when there's a dorsal dislocation, so meaning there's a planta uh, aspect of the ligament or the planta plate, like uh, uh, we can see very clearly on the second metatarsal joint, maybe there's some injury or tear over this uh, tissue. So in the case, we need to repair the, the planta plate and as well as the ligament over the planta aspect. And uh, what must be the reason of his neuritic pain? It, it may be the cause of the nerve that is uh, caught when the, the, uh, when the joint is dislocated. So it may be traction on, on the nerve as well. Okay. So uh, you write and then we went in with an MR which did so injury to the plantar plate of the fourth MTP joint. And the issue was what to offer to this patient because neither Viper nor Scorpion was available when I operated this patient in 2017. So, Professor Carlo, uh, for such a case, what would be your treatment? Okay. Um, professor, admittingly, in the Philippines, it's still not available at the present time. So, I have no okay. option to use it, <laughs> but um, basically what I do is um, we do uh, um, tendon transfers. So I do the traditional way of passing the, the extensor tendon plantarly um, to repair the plantar plate. Uh, I think that's the only option that I have right now. We, we have no viper or scorpion as well too. And Professor Kwai Ming, please, your view. Yes, I think uh, the girdle stone uh, first uh, to extend uh, uh, transfer is one of the options to stabilize the MTPJ. And um, if possible, I think they still try to explore the partner place where the um, direct repair with some stitches may also help. And I agree that the um, tendon transfer is uh, one of the good choice. Yeah. So that was. Uh, our plan, we, I think that was 2017, 18, I guess, plantar approach, neuroma and plantar plate repair and flexor to extensor transfer. So we took in a uh, inter uh, uh, metatarsal approach. We exposed it. There was a neuroma which was excised and we uh, had 1.8 mm suture anchor available with one suture anchor into the proximal phalanx base, we advanced the uh, plantar plate and repaired it there. We also harvested long flexor and its two slips were transferred dorsally onto the PIP joint, which was immobilized into 20 degree of plantar flexion, as you see in this picture. And this is how uh, with one anchor, uh, this repair looked like. And uh, uh, this were uh, the movements, uh, plantar flexion, dorsal flexion of the toes. Uh, so these are the movements at the end of uh, next four months. And he was then up and above for the first time after three years using uh, close footwear. Uh, uh, any thoughts on to this, uh, Professor Chua? Would you have done something differently or any critical comment onto this treatment? It's a very good result from Rajiv. Thank you. Uh, and this was also published in a Journal of Orthopedic Case Report where uh, this case was also published. And I will take up this as a last case and then I'm going to hand it over to Professor Kwai Ming for his cases. So 20 years old paramedic had a twisting injury while playing recreational cricket. Cricket is a religion in this part of world. And once he had this twisting injury while running, he could not stand or walk after the injury. He was taken out of the ground and unfortunately injury x-rays are not available. Case records also not available. But he was operated 
uh, in a tire C city, a town place by a orthopedic surgeon who probably did lateral ankle re ligament repair. Whether it was Brostrom Gold, no case records were available. He did this repair with a suture anchor. And this was the x ray available. Uh, Professor uh, Carlo, your comment on to this kind of uh, repair and suture anchor placement? Um, I think basing it on the x ray, the suture anchors were probably placed a bit more proximally than the usual um, attachment. So this could have. This might lead to um, over tightening of the lateral ligaments and maybe probably uh, end up in failure also of uh, the repair. Okay, so uh, this was the lateral x ray and uh, infection sets in, and this kind of uh, sinus and hypergranulation tissues were found onto the lateral aspect of the ankle and foot. Orthopedic surgeon debrided this twice and in spite of repetitive debridement, there were period of healing and then again sinuses used to come up and this scenario went on for another nine months and after nine months he was referred to us this is a closer look onto the soft tissue issues. This is how the sinus is used to open. It used to get closed, again used to open in spite of repetitive debridement. So any guess what is going wrong, Professor Kwai Ming? I think uh, it's very likely to infest on our one, the uh, suture anchor. I think uh, there's a deep infection that um, we should remove um, the, do the development and remove the uh, suture anchor. I think we can repeat the spray where that radiolucency or erosion of the bone around the uh, metallic uh, suture anchor. But and this young was, man never had, sorry, and also this young was, man never had temperature at all and zero was absolutely normal all throughout and the cultures were negative. Any? If, yeah, if so, I think uh, we also send the tissue for session for pathology for any hint or any say, um, uh, say uh, other type of infection, say tuberculosis or uh, maybe uh, to exclude tumor. I want this region, yeah. We are uh, more we are investing, yes, yeah. okay. Professor Chua, any guess what is going wrong in this young boy? Yeah, young I, think, uh, mm, I think when they went in for replacement, uh, the, the anchor suture may be still left behind. There's one possibility. And the second possibility that, yes, I agree with uh, the, the seal, that uh, need to send the culture to rule out tuberculosis as well, and not only uh, acute bacterial infection. So uh, these are two guesses that uh, uh, in this case, not adequate deployment by removing all the anchor suture as well as the, 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 the screw that inside the fibula. So I also thought in the same direction, but my thought process was, that maybe this kind of a repetitive uh, issues are sometimes because of allergic reaction to the suture material used. Exactly. And uh, this kind of issues are very common after ethibond, after utilization of ethibond. So I went in, I went in with the debridement. When I went in, I excised these all material, they were all suture reaction together with a kind of a, a fibro, a, a kind of a granuloma around uh, the suture anchor. So I ended up removing all this thing when I went 
through the debridement. And obviously, uh, when this was done, now this was the uh, uh, suture material and this was a kind of instability after finishing the surgery. So this was highly unstable. And this was now six weeks post debridement. Wounds healed well, serology normal, cultures negative, instability in a young patient. Uh, how would you go about this, uh, Professor Carlo? Okay. Um, I think since you don't have any more um, good tissue to repair, uh, you would need a reconstruction. So I would probably use a hamstring graft in order to reconstruct the ATFL and CFL in this patient. Perfect. So I also thought in the same direction that I need to use uh, hamstring. A CFL I found to be uh, good. So I went in and I reconstructed only anterior talofibular ligament uh, with one attachment into fibula, another attachment into the talus and everything healed and is now gone back to the practice sessions. Uh, is not a professional cricketer, but he's an amateur cricketer who loves to play daily. So, uh, uh, Professor Chua, would you have done something different for this patient? Yeah, first we have the aerograph in Malaysia. So, there's one option uh, by using the aerograph. Yeah. Okay. So for the want of the time, I, we have now 15 more minutes and Professor Kwai also requires uh, some um, few minutes for his cases. First, it's will... a very interesting guy. Uh, please uh, proceed your cases. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So this was a 23 years old male who got injury while playing volleyball. And this was two years back. This is the x-ray which he gave when he presented to me. In a very small fractured fragment of medial malleolus, uh, Professor Kwai Ming, you are an expert into the ankle fracture management. <laughs> what would be your management for such a small fragment of medial malleolus? In fact, uh, usually you will present just a, uh, the bony part is a small, but I think that the, uh, me, the deltoid on the medial side is a quite have a significant damage or evolution from the uh, middle malleolus. So I will um, reassess the ankle, uh, whether it's a fair with a middle instability, fair laxity uh, on stress wheel. I think it's a, it shows some uh, instability. So uh, it's a quite, in, if it's an acute injury, I will uh, Consider to repair. I think if it uh, opening or severe instability on stress, okay? Yeah. Professor Chua? Yes, this is an evolution fracture of delta ligament with the, uh, 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 I mean, the bone uh, looks small, but actually it can be quite big. So if I have opportunity, I will do a CT scan to look at the how big is the fragment and I, I will do the uh, surgery for him because this evolution fractures uh, by using either the ankle suture or in my practice we have a, a small hook break that is over the medial medullus that the hook you can uh, go closer uh, onto the bone and then pull toward the, uh, the non-fracture fragment and then you like a buttress the small fragment onto the uh, medial medullus uh, or else if it's too small, then if you force to excise it, then you need to use anchor suture to put back the deltoid ligament. And I would like to add so, one more. Okay. I also need to check uh, any symptom or sign on the lateral side, say the fibula and the injury. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I do not have uh, uh, so many of the back pictures. The pictures which he brought, probably CT scan was not done. And this is how index surgeon 
did the uh, uh, surgery and this was the x-ray at the end of nine months. So, Professor Carlo, uh, are you happy looking at this x-rays at the end of nine months? Patient is having pain, inability to walk, some kind of instable feeling. Okay, um, I think um, uh, what they did was probably a tension band wiring, but uh, they probably did not get much of that deltoid ligament um, incorporated in that fixation. So I would probably um, restart and do the same thing. Um, in this part of the world, uh, we usually do a uh, circlage band wiring only or tension band wiring because it's a lot cheaper. But if patient has uh, some finance uh, finances, uh, I would probably use a suture anchor to to revise this um, this fixation. So this was at the end of nine months with persistent pain, pain at the middle malleolus. So uh, patient went on to report to the index surgeon who ultimately removed the implants. Uh, and Professor uh, Kwai Ming, these are the pictures after removal of the implant. Uh, what next for you? I think it's uh, so um, some bogus of the uh, ankle and also there is a um, the instability of the middle ankle. Okay, for this I think we should um, I think in addition uh, one we need to excise the uh, some of the bony fragment around if it is small. And also, we should also repair or even reconsider to reconstruct the uh, delta ligament with other tendon grafts. So, so, suppose you do the surgery of this patient, you at the end of uh, two years uh, would go ahead with excision of this fragment. This was at the end of two years that this patient came to us. Uh, Professor Kwai Ming, what would be your treatment now? Young patient, two years, post-trauma, non-union, and patient goes into valgus when he stands. Your management at this juncture, please. Okay. Um, I think I will uh, take an x-ray of the whole leg to see the alignment of the whole leg. Also, uh, I suppose there's no factual injury of the fibula, okay? And if this uh, yeah. for the middle side, then uh, I would in fact uh, that for the uh, some bony fragments at the middle side, I, I think I will excise this and then uh, reconstruct the um, tendon ligament with tendon graft. Which tendon graft would you use for deltoid reconstruction? I think we can uh, use the hamstring graft. Okay, yeah. Can you see this in uh, space? Okay. Yeah. Professor Chua, you also like to use hamstring for reconstructing this? Yeah, it's one of the good choice. Okay. And uh, Professor Carlo, would you use hamstring or would you use a fiber tape together with some other ligament, some other tendon? Okay, um, usually for uh, deltoid ligament, sometimes they're, they're quite uh, robust, so there's probably not much uh, contracture. So I would probably use a fiber tape of our internal brace with the, uh, reattaching the primitive deltoid for this one, if it's, uh, if it's uh, possible. Uh, Professor Kwai Ming and Professor Chua, uh, they want to do reconstruction with her tendon, uh, while Professor uh, Carlo wants to do reconstruction with uh, internal brace. Uh, let me show you what I did. Patient, this were the clinical pictures, the standing front and back view, MRI was already there. He was very cautiously walking. He was all the time worried to walk on an RE1 surface and so two years of non-union of medial malleolus in a young patient, I went in with this kind of an incision and the fragment was lying 
almost free into the deltoid ligament. I excise the fragment and this is how the ankle was unstable. There was cross medial instability and with this long standing instability, Professor Carlo, I feel that the reconstruction has to be done with a strong uh, tissues. So uh, reconstruction was done with the hamstring with one tunnel into the medial malleolus, one tunnel into the uh, sustentaculum talli and one tunnel into talus. And I also used hamstring graft, which was of six mm size, a Y-shaped graft was used. It was used with a tight rope and this was the insertion into the medial malleolus. Insertion was then uh, doubly stabilized with the uh, interference screw. And then there was insertion of the graft into the uh, sustentaculum talli, into the talus, and a Y-shaped reconstruction ultimately was done. And this was the end result. So uh, that was my question, which I asked to uh, everybody, would you have done something differently? Uh, and what else could have been used as grafts? So, uh, Professor Chua, uh, if you were to have a choice, would you have selected hamstring or uh, would you have gone with uh, uh, tibialis posterior or peroneus longus as described in the literature? Yeah, I still use a hamstring or uh the fiber of the, the tape like your allograph yeah okay so professor carlo your comment on to this and that would be the last comment before we end yeah i, I think i would agree with what you did prof um if um intraoperatively you see that there's not much good tendon i think an, an autograph would be the best option and i would agree Hamstring, I don't like dealing with the other foot and ankle tendons. I think a hamstring is a good alternative for any kind of reconstruction. Okay. Thank Excellent. you very much, Professor Chua. Thank you very much, Professor Ming. Thank you very much, Professor Carlo, for your time. I know it's a late night there, Saturday night. Thank you for being with us. And Celine, uh, I cannot thank you enough for giving us this opportunity of discussing uh, such a kind of presentation which we see in this part of world. Over no, it, you, it is amazing and shocking to me the talent that you guys see with the challenges that you have with these cases. It's uh, it, it blows my mind away. So hats off to all of you for the expertise that you bring to this meeting. So I appreciate it. Um, we're going to uh, go away for a minute and we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.